Hello and welcome all to my first Honkai Star Rail lore explanation. I'll be clear up front and say that this video is based almost entirely on Star Rail lore alone and won't go much into the Honkai Impact 3rd story. For those that are interested in a video that gives a better explanation to those just entering the Honkai space and how that connects to this game, I recommend watching this great video by Homu Labs that I will have linked in the description and should be popping up in the top right corner currently. For those that have stuck around, I have tried to split this video up into helpful sections that you can skip around to with the chapters listed on the video timeline. Another warning here, all info in this video was taken from both the Star Rail website and the first closed beta test that was back in October that had story missions for people to view, which is all subject to change. This means anything I talk about and or show in this video could and may be different when the game fully launches. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Reach the end of the story in your own way. The most obvious thing to talk about first is the Astral Express itself. The Astral Express was a relic left behind by Akavili the Trailblazer, and it journeys along the same route that the previous Trailblazers took. Akavili was an Aeon, which I'll get more into during the Aeon chapter of this video. The first destination of the Express is Urelo 6, which it had already traveled to thousands of years ago. Himiko, who is a very important character to the train itself, as it says in her bio on the Star Rail website that she found and repaired the Express on her home planet, then tells us that after Akavili's passing, the old route, or the Star Rail, was blocked off by the Cancer of All Worlds, and that many of the planets along the Star Rail have languished due to the appearance of Stellarons. She then goes on to say our mission is to open up the Star Rail again and allow the train to continue its path along the Trailblaze. Now as for how the train actually travels along the Star Rail, we have Welt give a great explanation. Jumps are like this. It may feel novel the first time, but you'll slowly get used to it after a few more. What exactly is jumping? I can try to explain it in simpler terms for you. The train is motionless, but the tracks ahead are being compressed. Mm. Does that help at all? I may say that made no sense just to How see. about a geometry analogy? Okay. Imagine that you were standing on a large sphere. Mm -hmm. If you want to arrive at any point on the sphere, then you have to travel along the outer surface. Okay. When we jump, we take the shortest linear path between two points. For example, we get from point A to point B by traveling straight through, through the, the sphere, sphere instead of, of along, along the surface. surface. Or Got in other you. Words, we take the shortest path possible. That makes sense. Cool. Not only do we get that great explanation from Welt, but we actually get a mini cutscene showing the jump itself. And after the jump, we arrive at Yurilo 6, as Himiko explains why we travel along the Star Rail to visit these planets. It's to explore unknown planets, understand the current state of different worlds, establish relations with civilizations, and connect the Star Rail throughout the universe. For now, that was all I could find on the Star Rail and the Express itself, so let's move on to the Stellarons. Stellarons seem to be the main drive of many different forces and organizations in this universe. They've caused the destruction of many planets and Welt even calls them the seeds of disaster, 
originally planted on different planets by the Aeon Nanook, the destruction, we know from Himiko that their arrival on a planet causes massive changes to civilizations and ecologies, but they can also generate warps in space such as fragmentums, which we'll talk about more later on. We got a short paragraph of what Aeons are from a recent post by the Star Rail team that goes as follows. People know very little about the mysterious beings that dwell in the deep stellar ocean. Constrained by their limited cognition, intelligent lifeforms can only slightly perceive the paths that Aeons tread upon, and rely on mere concepts and theories to vaguely comprehend the vastness of their powers. Eventually, through spoken legends, these Aeons become the embodiments of abstract concepts. From what we could gather from this, the Aeons are the god equivalent in this world. Hoyoverse tends to do this in most of their games. In Honkai, it was Hershers. In Genshin, it was Archons. And here in Star Rail, it's the Aeons. There were tons of Aeons that were name dropped throughout the beta, and we actually got quite a few blocks of information that also explained each Aeon has a following, or in some cases, a cult. We call these the factions of the Aeons. Let's go over the Aeons we have information on and their respective factions. First up, let's talk about the Trailblaze, aka Akavili. Akavili was originally from a planet called Pagana, but he decided to leave this planet in search of finding the edge of existence. Akavili's dream was short-lived though, as he was abruptly ended due to an accident we have no information on. The only faction that I could find that associates themselves with Akavili are the Nameless, which the Nameless are a group of adventurers that rode in the Express with Akavili, or at least legend has it that Akavili loved walking among the mortals. The Nameless would disguise the moving Express as a trail of a shooting star and laugh at the people looking up in awe. However, once Akavili had fallen, there was still a group of loyal Nameless that continued on their exploration. However, in this description, it also says that the Star Rail has been corrupted by an unknown cancer. Next up, Nanook, the destruction. Nanook believes the birth of the universe was a mistake. Nanook wants to become the avatar of entropy and wipe out all life. He is the one responsible for putting Stellarons in planets to cause them to rot, and I believe he is the creator of the Stellarons themselves. From a loading screen tip in the beta, we learn that Nanook was born from Adlavun, as the world fell and often appears as a human male with dark skin and crimson eyes. He has the most dangerous followers as they too believe life is worthless. Even in the quote we got along with the description for Nanook, it is said by a scientist moments before pressing a button for nuclear detonation. The faction that follows under Nanook is the Antimatter Legion, whose members have embarked on a path of chaos and destruction. They are known for spreading terror throughout the universe. They actively destroy new and innocent worlds and have the fiercest races of the universe join them as a vanguard for their legion. Stay clear of the Antimatter Legion. On a not so much more lighthearted note, we have the Hunt, Lon, who roams the universe to destroy the undead beings that once plagued his home world. Lon does not see a difference in salvation and total destruction. He has been called the Archer Lord of Fate and has unyielding determination. The Jin Chao Alliance is the faction that follows the path of the hunt. They were formed after Jin Chao was saved by Lon, who used gravity as a bowstring and the stars as the arrows to break the foundation and put the wickedness of the fertility to an end. Lon and the Alliance are out to destroy the ideals and worshippers to those of Yaoshi and the pursuit of immortality. Well, let's go ahead and talk about Yaoshi. This is where we already start to see some of the story changes from the closed beta test and now. Back in the first closed beta in October of 2021, Yaoshi was listed as the Fertility, and so were the factions that followed him. But according to the new Aeon text that we received about a week ago, it appears Yaoshi has been changed to the Abundance. Yaoshi is the nurturer of the people, a god of peace, one who cannot bear to witness death and the pains of illness. Yaoshi seeks to have everyone and everything be immortal, which causes conflicts with those who follow Lon, the Aeon of the Hunt. The faction that follows Yaoshi are the denizens of fertility, who we can assume have been renamed to denizens of abundance. The denizens create poetry and art in the name of their god, and hope to spread love throughout the universe. They all reside in a world touched by Yaoshi, where the water never runs dry and the creatures are free from the cruel binds of time. 
As shown in the text, there are a few who have heard of astral hunters who regard Yaoshi as a demon god and creations of Yaoshi as a sin. Loyal denizens cannot accept such blasphemy and will retaliate against the defamatory accusers. Now, one of the most interesting aeons is the erudition, Naus, which is the first example of a non-human aeon. Naus is described as a supercomputer whose goal was to provide answers to all questions in the universe and ended up ascending into aeonhood. This tells us that not only can you ascend and become an aeon yourself, but that non-living things can as well. I found two factions that follow Naus, the first being the Erudition Association, who will accept any being from any place who seeks to learn, as well as any conditions for the full pursuit of knowledge. They advocate that all knowledge must be circulated like currency. This leads their school system to be much more intertwined even if they are for different fields. They trade knowledge for wisdom and formulas for recipes, all to achieve mastery. They are not fond of the members of circles sagacious, who seem to be seen to waste and see the association as a laughingstock. The second faction, being the Circle Sagacious referred to before, is less of a group of working people and those that have felt the approval and favor of Nurse. Nurse will send a signal to a spark of intelligence, inviting geniuses to join in the search for the answers of the universe. There is one notable name listed under this faction, and that is Erudite, who few can ascertain his intentions. Only those that break free from the shackles of worldly curiosity can become true members of the Circle Sagacious. Now we get to have a break from the destruction and chaos with the happy tunes of Jepe, the Harmony. Jepe is a gathering of aeons from multiple divine worlds of music. They seek to calm and connect others with the joy and happiness of music and form harmony, support weakness with strength, and protect life with death. Jepe is another instance of where we see ch uh, changes already made from the beta as they were previously referred to as Jipe and Aeon of Concord. If we go by the previous listing, we can assume that the family is the faction that follows Jepe. The family is quite frankly a cult, seen calling civilizations that join them as brothers and sisters that sing in unity whose love is found nowhere else in the universe. The family will call out to other worlds to join with their song, and those that agree are met with celebration and joy, while those that decline perish out of their stupidity and their hubris. When asked if there are those that have grown tired of singing and wish to leave the path of Concord, they smile and reply, never. One of the most mysterious Aeons is Nine, the Nihility. Nine does not interact with the other Aeons, and believes that the ultimate fate of the multiverse is nothingness, and therefore, existence is worthless. The faction that follows the Nihility is the Doctors of Chaos, who honor existence, which seems to counter the ideal of Nine. It is said that when a being has thought of existence as nothingness, then they step onto the path of the Nine and are prone to two outcomes. One, truly transform into a being of nothingness and be known as a self-annihilator. Or two, they'll be captivated by the Aeon and become curious, thereby becoming a Doctor of Chaos. Those who take the second path uphold a creed to keep existence to try and prove to Nine that existence is not worthless and wish to free the large and lonely soul from the depths of the void. This is seen as a futile revolt against their destiny. Ever heard of Attack on Titan? Cool. Well, Klopoth the Preservation has as well. Klopoth was the builder of the celestial comet Wall, which is described as a subspace crystalline barrier and the great attractor base. Followers call them the Amber Lord and is one of the oldest aeons to exist, having lived the Dusk Wars. I believe this is something similar to Genshin with how they had the Archon War, and few survived that as well. After finding out that danger was near, the Amber Lord erected a light years long seal that would isolate and protect the living worlds. The people of Bellabog see this Aeon as their savior and worship them for having saved them from the Eternal Freeze, even having statues dedicated to him in the center of their town. There are two factions I could find that follow Glapoth. The first being the Inter-Astral Peace Corporation, who has become a consortium advocating free trade. The IPC, as I will be referring to them from now on, is a corporation that issues money and monopolizes resources oftentimes appearing to be wherever a transaction is held. In fact, almost all transactions are based on the credit system created by the corporation. They are the top dog in interastral trade, and oftentimes being seen as a dictatorship, and as such, they pay little attention to those below them, only wanting to quote, give our everything to Amber Lord Glapoth. 
the second faction being the Architects, who looked upon Glapoth in admiration and gathered to build barriers around to protect their planets. On rare occasions, worlds that were saved by the walls no longer mocked the stubbornness of the Architects, but joined them, never to question their motives or meaning of preservation again. Those are all the Aeons that have been highlighted by the most recent Star Rail posts made public, which leads me to believe that those are the main ones that will appear in the story and have impacts on our main character. However, there are still many Aeons that were shown in the first closed beta test that I would like to cover very quickly. The first being Ouroboros, the Veracity, which is a sentient black hole that has become an Aeon that thirsts and has an unsatisfied hunger for worlds. This is the second instance in which an Aeon is not a human, which brings the criteria to becoming an Aeon to just be something that has a consciousness and self-thought. There are no known factions to the Veracity. Idrila, the Beauty Idrila believed the ultimate meaning of existence to be the ever-changing view of beauty. The Aeon of Beauty suddenly vanished one day. It was just as mysterious as when they first appeared. The only lore I could find on factions of Idrila is when Himiko mentions that along with her passing, so did the quote, Knights of Beauty. Following the trend of non-human Aeons, we have Tazaranth, the Propagator. Tazaranth is a Swarm King, the Sand King, and the creator of the Swarm Disaster. They were the last members of the Coloptera that ruled the land. This loneliness drove them to an infinite duplication, bringing horrors of the world before their advances were halted by fate. The faction that follows the Swarm is the Swarm itself. It does not seek a following, for worship is an unnecessary desire. Only the flying creatures that succumb to the primal instinct will be attracted to the Swarm, only to be eaten and reformed to join along their side. Finally, we have our last Aeon of the day, Aha, the Joy. Aha believes that it is the birthright of intelligent lifeforms to understand the joys of life, whether that be playing games to pass time, seeking laughter, or even a song that brings life to your body. I was able to find two factions that follow Aha, the first being the Masked Fools, who saw Aha burst into laughter after seeing a baby fall to the ground and cry, which led them to believe that laughter is the end-all be-all, going so far that they often cause havoc wherever they go. They laugh at anything and everything, including heroes for their self-righteousness, kings for their lust of power, lovers for their crazy infatuation, and scholars for their overthinking. Their goal being to surge about change, even if it's only to the fools that derive pleasure. The second faction being the mourning actors, who are not much better than the mass fools. The actors believe in renouncing joy and to embrace and endure grief to temper the spirits. They see joy as a narcotic for losing yourself, and don't see a purpose in seeking joy when it's a fleeting feeling you have to continue to search for. Aha found potential in the beauty of tragedy, perhaps out of fondness of dark humor. Aha blessed these people with astral power, playfully helping them spread their renouncement of joy across many galaxies. Wow, that was a lot of information, and there is even one more faction I need to talk about, but they seem to not follow any Aeon, and act on their own accord. I decided to make them their own mini-chapter. But that was everything I could find about the Aeons and their factions. If you could choose an Aeon to follow, which would you choose, and what faction? Let me know in the comments below. The Stellaron Hunters are one of, if not the most intriguing faction of the bunch. They are the only ones that do not follow a specific Aeon. They're wanted dead or alive, and most importantly, they want the Stellarons. These few have decided to travel the universe in search of the Stellarons despite their reputation to be the manifestation of destruction. The only issue is no one knows why they want them. There is no indication if they want to use them for good or evil, if you can even use them for good. Do they want to collect them all and destroy them? The only thing we know is that each and every member is capable of incredible capacities and powers. A notice was sent by the Inter-Astral Peace Corporation saying, Blade, Silverwolf, Sam. The four mentioned above, dead or alive, do not hurt the destiny slave and do not let them lose their ability of independent thinking. Silverwolf we know and have as a playable character. We also know that Kafka is another Stellaron hunter and is close with the destiny child, who she calls Elio. If we take a look at Kafka's splash art, we can see Silverwolf to her left and who we can assume is Elio on her right wearing a nice suit. 
Unfortunately, there is an umbrella covering most of the members and even Elio's face. But if I had to take a wild guess, I believe Elio is an alt-universe version of Kevin from the Honkai Impact 3rd story. They are going to be closely tied to the MC since we ourselves have a Celeron inside of our body. Since we're starting to get more into the characters, let's go ahead and cover all the ones we know. I must leave now. Listen, someone will come and find you very soon. Just go with them. You won't remember a thing except me. The first characters up are the Celeron Hunters. We know that Kafka is on the Inter-Astral Peace Corporation's wanted list. We also learn from her bio that she likes to collect coats, and that she is the Destiny Slave's Elio's most trusted member. We also learn that she wants to achieve Elio's envisioned future. I could get AI to do these tasks, but I'd do it myself. Hacking is like fighting. You have to have a feel for it. The next known Stellaron Hunter is Silverwolf. She is a super hacker who had a hack battle with Skrulum of the Genius Society, which has become legend. Is the past that important? Different people will answer differently. Now, on the Astral Express, we have quite a few more characters. We can start with Don Hung, who is cold and reserved. We also know that his spear is known as the Cloud Piercer, and that he acts as the Express's guard. Don Hung is running from his past, and as such, does not like to talk about it. Who I am. Where I'm from. I've forgotten it all. For now... I'm hanging out on this train and following it to whatever destination it decides to stop at. By tagging along, maybe I can find out about my past. March 7th is a quirky, high spirit, and cute girl who likes to take pictures in case she ever loses her memories again. We know that March 7th was found floating in space, frozen in a piece of six-phased ice, something not commonly found on planets. March 7th is named after the day that she was unfrozen. We also know that March 7th can subconsciously create ice to protect herself in an emergency. March 7th has amnesia from when she was frozen and does not have any memories before then. You want to know the rules of the train? Don't break anything. Don't go into the engine room. And definitely don't go asking dull questions like, how come this train can travel through the universe? Next up is Himiko, who first encountered the Astral Express as a child when he got stranded in her home world. She actually repaired the train and began her journey to the stars. We also know that Himiko has vast knowledge on Aeons and how the paths of the Aeons work. The galaxy is vast beyond compare, containing an infinite number of possibilities. An individual's fate shouldn't be limited to a single path ordained by heaven. Next is Welt the former anti-entropy sovereign. He has saved Earth from annihilation multiple times. And after the events of St. Fontaine came to a close, Welt joined the initiator of the incident to the other side of the portal. We can assume that the initiator is the Void Archives, but again, I don't want to go too deep into the Honkai Impact third story, so we'll be straying away from that. Whatever it is you need, I got the goods. If you got the cash. <laughs> As for the characters that we find in Bellabog on Urelo 6, first up is Sampo, who is a silver-tongued salesman who has unique knowledge that many seek. Becoming his customer is not necessarily a good thing, as his customers can quickly turn into commodities for the right price. Sampo does have relationships with the Wildfire. The steadfast architects built this city. Under the protection of Klepoth the Preservation, Bellabog remains forever warm in the face of unrelenting cold. Next is Gepard, who is the captain of the Silverman Guards and bears the noble Landau family name, and only wants what's best for Bellabog. The real purpose of maintenance should be to protect and nurture each machine like one of your own, so it can be what it was made to be. But our society seems to want to reap all the benefits of technology while having as little to do with it as possible. Now let's talk about his sister, Serval, who is the eldest daughter of the Landau family, who is free and rebellious. We learned that Serval is the owner of the Neverwinter Workshop, which doesn't make much money and is considered a hobby. Serval is also the lead guitarist in the rock and roll band called Mechanical Fever. 
We also learned that Sorvo worked for the Research and Development Department of the Union. Her main research subject was Geomero. I herewith temporarily strip you of your freedom of action and speech. Please, trust me to offer you a fair trial and the opportunity to clear your names with the whole of Bellabog as the witness. Next is Branya, heir to the Supreme Guardian of Bellabog. She is the commander of the Silverman Guards and received rigorous training from an early age and possesses grace worthy of an heir. Branya has seen the truth of the abysmal conditions in the underworld and has started to grow doubtful of her future as heir. Captain, Intelligence Officer Paler reporting. This event was not premeditated. The suspect acted alone and has been controlled by the Silvermane Guards. No casualties found on either side. Pella, who is an intelligence officer of the Silvermane Guards. She's young but brilliant and has great knowledge of maneuvering troops, distributing supplies, or the terrain. She also has a phone case of Tears of Timis, which is another game made by Hoyoverse. A quote she has of the phone case is, It has nothing to do with work, Captain. Pella is also the lead singer of Serval's band, The Mechanical Fever. For the people here, especially the sick, death is a far easier choice than living. But when... Uh, when will I finally find a cure for the disease? Natasha. Natasha is a doctor with a curious smile who lives in the underworld. She's one of the only doctors in the underworld who is great with kids. There is more information on Natasha in the next chapter, but I'm going to refrain from saying it due to spoilers. To use our strength to create a fair society. Isn't that the obvious goal? Next is Sele, who is a member of the Wildfire and grew up in the underworld. Sele grew up being alone and grew up on the streets until Natasha took her in. Sele is seen often humming the song Butterfly on the Blade Tip, which was taught to her by Natasha. There's also a quote that says the world Sele grew up knowing was a simple dichotomy, that is, until that girl appeared, which we can assume that girl is Branya, which will be later touched on in the next chapter. Miners in Wildfire don't really understand you, Mr. Sparog. I, I will talk to them. No need. Understanding from a small group of subjects will not change the result of the calculation. That indicates human behavior always deviates from reason. Finally, Clara, who was a little girl that was raised by a robot named Varog. Her perceptiveness and tenacity are far beyond her years. Clara believes that Varog's logical calculations are law and infallible, until she saw it hurt people. Clara has cast away her once shy and timidness and now wants all of Bellabog to be her family. Clara is very good at fixing machines. Don't get me wrong, it's just that I always act on my principle that the safety of the space station comes first. It's nothing personal. On the Herta Space Station, we have Arlen, who is an inarticulate head of the Herta Space Station security and is willing to risk his life for science and those who seek it. Arlen is used to pain and wears the scars like badges of honor. He only lets his guard down and smiles when he's with Peppy. The test samples that I'm currently cultivating on the space station won't steal my dinner, right? No, no, bugs are not my dinner. But that does bring one to the question, are bugs nice to eat? Asta, the energetic lead researcher of the Herda space station. Asta manages the staff and responds to the Intelligentsia Guild. I'm already perfect. What else should I do? Of course, I could write another couple of books. But what would I get out of that? Why should I bother? Finally, we have Herda, which is Herda Space Station's true master. Herda is a human with the highest IQ. Herda tends to appear in the form of a ranged puppet. There's a quote that says, It's about 70% similar to how I looked as a child, which we can assume means that Herda remotely controls the puppet from a faraway distance and that this is not her true form. For this final chapter, I decided to go ahead and re-watch the entirety of the story that was presented in the closed beta test 1. I wrote down every single key point throughout the entire story, and I have... <laughs> this story was very long. Listen, I did a lot of work here. <laughs> I recapped this story to fit under 20 minutes. I'll be talking very, very fast, 
and it will be include a lot of spoilers for the actual beginning story chapters of Star Rail. I'm including this in case this part of the story is not actually included in the closed beta test 2 and you're interested in either what happened before or just what happened in general during the first beta test. I'll be speaking very, very quickly, and I will try and make it as clear as possible, but without further ado, let's go over the entirety of the closed beta test 1 story. We start off on the Astral Express as the rest of the crew explains the world a bit and why we are here. We then make a jump to Eurelius 6, but get stopped in our path by disruption by a Stellaron on the planet. Himiko then sends the main character, March 7th, and Dong Hung down to the planet to investigate. We learn that the Trailblaze lends the Nameless powers and allows them to withstand harsh climates easily. We hear from March 7th that we have tickets, which seem to allow us to teleport back to the Express, but Dong Hung explains that they are not get off a planet free card. We then start heading north as we learn that north is warmer on the Relo 6. March 7th spots something moving in the snow and we move to take a look. This is when we first meet Sampo. Sampo names drops someone by the name of Captain Landau, mentions a group called the Blue Coats and who seem to be Sampo's enemy. Sampo then explains that leaving the overworld without authorization is a crime. Sampo continues to explain that we are heading to the last city that was saved thanks to Plamia. We run into some Silverman guards and have our first fight. The fight is interrupted by Gapard. Sampo runs away during the fight and left us to the guards. We have to explain that we are not with Sampo. We then learn that Gapard is Captain Landau. We explain to Gapard that we are not from their city, and we see that Gapard is surprised that we are that we were living humans past Bellabog. Gapard believes us since our clothes are so different from theirs. We, he then explains that we are the first evidence of humans outside of the Union in thousands of years. Once inside Bellabog, we learn that it is the last stronghold against the Eternal Freeze. Gapard then explains to us that the that before the Eternal Freeze and the Age of Guilt, there were many cities like Bellabog, but the world was brimming with evil and scoured by fire and smoke. The carbonic and sulfurous flames awakened a devil slumbering underneath its surface, causing the Eternal Freeze, a front of piercing cold that destroyed all in its wake, except for Bellabog, due to Plamia's protection. Dong Hung notices and explains that the way he said that seems that he read it out of a historical textbook and not from known knowledge. This is our first hint that the history is not what it seems. We then meet Pella. Gapard and Pella discuss the whereabouts of Sampao and how he got there. Pella mentions that he may be a lost one from that place, which we quickly learn that place is the underground. We then meet Branya and Kakolia. Kakolia discusses our squad of three and knows that the main character has a Stellaron and mentions that it will bring about their end. Kakolia asks Branya if she remembers the admonishments. Branya responds with keep careful watch over the walls for a devil shall fall upon us like a blizzard and disaster shall chill humanity to the core. The seed has already been planted. One day, Ruin shall revisit these lands. Kakolia expresses that those are Plamia's teachings. Kakolia then asks Branya to bring us to her so that she can pass judgment and purify us. Branya calls Kakolia by Madam Consul and is then told by Kakolia that she can call her mother when no one else is around. It then cuts back to us following Pella and we meet Serval. Serval is one of the most attractive women in the game and this is not debatable. We learn that Serval is Gapard's sister. We then have an encounter with Branya who says she will take us off of Pella's hands. She then explains to us that Kakolia predicted strangers bearing a seed of ruin will enter the city and that we will need to go with her. Then mentions that Consul's prophecy is correct and irrefutable. Branya surrounds us with Silverman guards as we get a cutscene of us attacking and escaping through Fragmentum. Wait for my signal. But it sounds like some parts will be maybe, I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. <laughs> oh yeah, hit him with the bat. Oh, this looks good. March 7th explains that the Fragmentum is a dis distorted alternate dimension and that if they mess up, they would never make it out. We learn that the Fragmentum can faithfully recreate places and materials in the past. Learn that the IPC does not trade stuff related to the other Aeons. We then find a fissure which is an exit to the Fragmentum, but we have no clue where it could, where it could exit us to. We get a cutscene surrounded by Branya and Silverman guards. We learn the Union has spent hundreds of years in funding into research of the Fragmentum. We learn that Branya's last name is Rand. Sampo then shows up, and we get a cutscene of him saving us. Oh, I missed you. How's it been? How you doing? <laughs> what is this? I better not be sleeping, guys. <laughs> I can't breathe. 
Ah, Spanish guitar music. I have one thing to say. Sampo never lets friends who've helped him come to harm. <laughs> I say what I mean and mean what I say. Okay, hermano, lo veo. We hear a new lady's voice who tells us we need to inherit everything. I believe this may be Kafka's voice, but we later on get similar instances where we're asleep and get messages from Plamia, so I'm not too sure. We then wake up and meet Natasha. Natasha tells us that Sampo also took Branya along with us to the underworld. Sampo asks if this matter will be handled by the Wildfire. Natasha tells us that Wildfire does things to, does things to people from the overworld. Natasha leaves and Sampo tells us that we were sleep talking and babbling about destruction, Stellarons, and other scary things. Sampo then tells us he needs our help in recapturing Branya and to find March 7th. Sampo explains that if either the Bluecoats or the Wildfire found out he smuggled an overworld person down here, they would not let him go. We learn that Natasha is a doctor, and we learn that the Underworld has an endless supply of Geomero, which supplies energy and warmth for both the Underworld and the Overworld. We tell Don Hung about the strange dream we had, and he guesses it may be due to us being closer to the Stellaron on the planet. We find March 7th along, along with a crowd watching Branya causing trouble, as March 7th says she, can't, she cannot open her mouth without calling someone a devil or impertinent. March 7th then explains Branya ran into someone and they grabbed her arms, which caused her to throw them to the ground. We start to try and help Branya as someone shoots her. We then get a cutscene of, of Sele. Sampo greets Sele and name drops Svarog. Sele tells Sampo to shut up. We love her. <laughs> she then says that her chief wants to see us. We learn that Wildfire have eyes everywhere and has all knowledge of what is going on in the overworld. Don Hong expresses his lack of trust in Sampo. He then asks us if we know what Sampo used to put us to sleep in the rescue and explains that he is not affected by normal poisons. March 7th explains that Welt holds the record for the longest time away from the train at a whopping two months. Sampo explains that the rest of the blue coats take the ore mined in the underworld and barely give anything in exchange. He also explains that Sele is the trusted backbone to Oleg. All passageways from the underworld to the overworld under control by wildfire. Branya explains to us the residents of the underworld are traitors of the overworld that have been sealed under. She then explains that she does not really see the people down here as devils and we start to see her question her own knowledge of the event history. We then meet the chief. We find out that Olog is the name of the chief. Olog questions why we are here and he explains we are not from this planet. He then says he will help us get back to the overworld and tells Branya to take a look at the underworld and see that what the overworld has told her is lies. Don Hung asks Oleg if he had heard of a Stellaron, which he replies no. Oleg assigns Sele to watch over us as we do assignments. We meet up with Sele to do our first assignment as she describes that if we find Geomero, we need to stay away from it because it has an energy that makes people lose their mind. She then says that if you are around it without protective gear, your body starts to twist and wither. We learn the protective gear does not guarantee 100% safety and the sickness is known as the crystallization sickness, which starts off in the lungs and causes the body to crystallize. There is no cure. Sele continues to explain that recently there have been a bunch of profiters that came out of nowhere and started selling wonder medicine, which promises to cure the sickness, and some have actually had reduced symptoms after taking it. The medicine is only sold on the black market. We then learn that the medicine only stops the symptoms and pain for a short while, but then the sickness comes back even stronger than before. We are then tasked with talking to nearby people about the medicine and what they know. We find out that the dealer's name is Dodge. We find a medicine dealer and ask him to tell us where Dodge is. He says the last time he saw Dodge was selling medicine to some kids and lets us know what he was wearing. We shortly thereafter find Dodge threatening a kid. We hear Dodge say that he found the medicine in that place and risked his life to get it. He then. We then meet Hook, who confronted Dodge. She calls herself the boss of the moles. Dodge threatens to beat up Hook, but then Branya then threatens to beat up Dodge. Hook tells us adults to go away, and it is revealed that the other kid was a part of the moles as well and planned on beating up Dodge. 
She explains that the moles are a group that specializes in defeating villains and bring light and order to the underworld. We find out that Hook and Clara reside in Natasha's clinic. Natasha shows up and we question Dodge on where the medicine came from. We go back to Natasha's clinic as she reveals that she's been doing research on the medicine. She explains that the medicine can indeed delay the onset of the sickness, but then goes on to say how it has many lethal side effects and that she does not recognize some of the ingredients. The production of the medicine requires a high degree of training. We find out that the underworld caused the fragmentum, the devil's stomach. After the cast discusses, we assume the medicine was found in the fragmentum. We leave Natasha's clinic and find that Branya no longer considers the people of the underworld as devils. She then says once, she returns to the surface, she will confront her mother about the underworld. We find out that Sele lived on the streets till Natasha took her in. She name drops Vouch. Hook offers us to join the moles. We accept to join the moles. We then meet Firstman, who is introduced as Hook's father. Firstman is seen very sickly and is constantly coughing. We then find out that he works in the Geomero mines and is upset that he never gets to spend time with his daughter. We then speak to Sampo and find out that Vash is Natasha's brother who was also her mentor, but has been missing for some time now. Natasha comes out of the clinic and we make a plan to find and cut off the medicine at its source. Clara is introduced during that conversation. She describes how she was looking for Hook to see if she was starting trouble. It is hinted that Clara may have the sickness. Sele then leaves to do her own task assigned by Olog and Natasha joins us into the Fragmentum to find the medicine. Once we enter the Fragmentum, we see a dead body that has been fully taken over by the sickness. After exploring more, we find another dead body with a note on it, saying how someone handed them a bag of medicine telling them to run back and give it to all the people with the crystallization sickness. We then explore further in and find a small base talking more about the medicine. After walking even deeper, we find a guard behind a gate that has completely lost his mind due to the sickness and is laughing, saying crazy dialogue. He asks us to find two of his friends insignias for him to open the gate. After we find the two guards and beat them up and bring the insignias back, he opens the gate as promised. We find another insignia and find a lab locked behind another gate. We notice that there are words written on the back of each insignia and solve a puzzle to find the key to the gate. Once we open the gate, we find a huge lab that looks like Natasha's clinic. We find out that the doctor that made the lab decided to turn himself into a crystallization sickness patient to find a solution. Then another note explains that the doctor found a cure for the sickness but was turned into a monster for staying in the Fragmentum for too long. Another note shows that the doctor starting, started seeing hallucinations. March 7th finds a trinket that Natasha says was a gift she gave to Vouch. It is then confirmed that the doctor we have been reading about was Natasha's brother. Natasha continues to explain that Vouch was someone dispatched from the overworld to keep an eye on the underworld. The monster version of Vouch shows up for a mini boss fight. We are then met with a decision to either lock the lab and leave the equipment or destroy all of the lab equipment. This is the first instance of a diverging story that was shown in the beta. After you select an option, we return to Oleg and report our findings. We have ended the medicine problem. Our next mission is to go and find Fursman in the mine and protect him from monsters while also trying to better the relations between him and Oleg. The cast then goes back to rest for a bit where we get a talk from Plamia in our dreams. An earthquake wakes up the cast. There was a collapse in Fursman's mind, and the new task is to save as many people as possible. Oleg tells us more of Zabarag and how he is the biggest danger in the underground. As we arrive in the mine, we find Hook outside asking us to find her dad. Sele asks Hook to go home. After we go inside the mine, we find a miner named Joshua who tells us that there were 12 people inside who all got out except three. Svarog's people were already inside. Going a little deeper in, we meet two prospectors who try to stop us. After beating the prospectors, we go deeper inside and find Hook. Hook then explains while crying that she came in looking for her dad because it's her birthday and he prepared a gift for her. She also explains that she has a gift for him and she joins us so that she can give it to him herself. A little deeper in, we find two of the three lost people in the mine, only leaving Fursman left. Sele gives us more information on Zvarog, saying people think of him and the prospectors are either looking for old weaponry or making a robot army to fight the overworld. We then find Fursman talking to the prospectors and appears to be working with them. It could be that the mine collapse was premeditated and not an accident. Going a little deeper in, we run into Zvarog, who we find out is a giant buff robot. During the confrontations, Zvarog kidnapped Hook. We met up with Fursman and Zvarog, where we learned that Fursman was in fact working together with Zvarog and the prospectors. After beating one of Zvarog's robots, we try and get Fursman out, but he explains that he cannot go any further due to his illness. He tells us that he wanted a way to die without losing all dignity, and gives us a diary saying that everything he wants to say is in there. The crew rushes out of the mine and meets up with Natasha, who finds out Fursman died in the mine. Sele explains that the goal of the wildfire is to improve the welfare of all undergrounders, maintain order, repel prospectors, 
prospectors and rep repair and recycle relics. Bronya explains why she is attached to Hook and is very worried for her well-being. She then continues saying that she will try her best to convince Madame Kokolia about the nature of the underworld. The cast then reports to Oleg and that the mining accident was Varog's fault. We are then tasked with working with Wildfire to take down Varog. Olog explains that Varog has se is seen by many as a mechanical god. Olog explains that Varog may have hundreds of years of historical information stored inside him, and if he is unwilling to share it, then we have no choice but to defeat him. After meeting up with Sampu as our guide, we leave to find Varog. Sampu takes us to the secret camp of Varog. After solving certification to get inside the first gate, we are then blocked again by a prospector who mentions the Bloody Rabbit. We then go back to the Fragmentum to search for the Bloody Rabbit. We quickly learn that Clara is the Bloody Rabbit. Clara explains that she is friends with Varog and he is very nice to her. We follow Clara to gather some robot parts and learn that Dong Hung used to grow plants. She brings us to Svarog and find out that Clara is more sick than we originally thought. Svarog tells Clara to go home so he can talk to us. Svarog mentions that he is a part of the Geomero development group, which is a group that has long perished, but since he has been rebooted, he will, he will rebuild the group and continue their mission. After a fight with Svarog, Natasha and others show up to help. Sele then shows doubt in Wildfire as, as many people have started to say that Wildfire has a secret agenda to start a war. Ron explains that when she gets back to the overworld, she will try and stop the hunt for the crew and will ask Akolia for their true goals. Natasha lets us know that a prospector took Hook back to the clinic before we arrived at Svarog's camp. She dropped a massive bomb on us telling her that she is actually the true chief of the wildfire and Oleg is just a public front so she can run it from the shadows. She then continues saying the true goal of the wildfire is to get everyone back to the overworld and, the Geo and leave the Geomero behind. Natasha says that she will allow all of us to go back to the surface. After resting up, we meet up with Oleg again who explains that some of the research we found is Vrog's files and that the Geomero appeared after a meteor fell from the sky and that it caused the eternal freeze. He mentions something called the Solar Furnace Core and we take it as our first lead for the Celeron. We go and find Bronya and we catch a very cute moment between Sele and Bronya where they become friends. Sele leaves to let Bronya and the main character talk where we learn that she will stay in the underground for just a while longer to learn more about the Union's history. Senpo then takes us back to the surface. Bronya leaves to return to the Madam Console. Senpo takes us to the Wildfire hideout in the overworld. While in the hideout, Dong Hung explains, we should return to the Express and update Walt and Himiko on the events that happened and ask how we should continue. We return to the train and speak with Welt, who examines a sample of the Geomero and explains that it is giving ionizing radiation, which is more or less the same as nuclear radiation. We return to the overworld and meet up with Sampa, who explains he has a guide that can help us find the solar furnace core. It then cuts to Bronya confronting Kokolia. Bronya explains to Kokolia that the people in the underworld are not devils, and that they should work together with the underworld, who gets cut off by Kokolia. We then see Kakalia show her true colors and says that she knows what's been happening down in the underworld, but we need it for the overworld to thrive. They, the two argue back and forth before Kakalia then asks the guards to lock Branya up in the dungeon of the console residence. It then cuts back to the main crew as Sampo explains that the guide he mentioned before is actually Serval. It is shown while Serval talks to Pella that Serval used to be friends with Kakalia. We then go inside Serval's shop and explain everything that happened and how we need to find the solar core. She then explains that she used to work for the research and development department of the Union. Her main research subject was Geomero. We decide that the best option is to find the core is to go to the end of the Geomero supply chain, which is located at a camp of Silverman guards. Serval explains that she's good friends with the guards and can get us in there easily. Sampo decides to stay out of this mission as we leave to go to the camp, Gapard knocks on the door. The main cast hides as Serval tries to play it cool. Capard asks Serval to go to the camp and fix the generator there since she built it. Once Capard leaves, we all head to the camp where it is shown that all the guards are huge fans of Serval from her rock and roll shows. Silver repaired a drone and fixes it to act as a Geomero Geiger counter. After exploring, we find an energy mechanism hub. To get to the hub, we need to find an encryption key, which is said to be with Captain Dunn. We find Captain Dunn, who Serval introduces to us as the previous keyboard player in her band. Dunn refuses to give us the encryption key, so we fight him for it. After defeating Dunn, we get the key and the alarms are raised. We then have to stealth our way to the hub. After getting access to the hub, we gain access to the gear bridge and find the entrance to the corridor of seals, which is where the core is located. Sampo shows up and saves us from the guards that surround us, and once back at the base, Sele is inside the hideout, and we all head back to the entrance of the Corridor of Seals and enter. As we enter deeper into the Corridor of Seals, our main character feels dizzy and passes out. During this time, we hear Plamia's echo that says, The Echo of Doom, a world falling apart, the final salvation, hidden in the Stellaron. Find it and approach it. We then wake up and the exp then explore deeper into the seal and find an old letter written to Madame Rand, who Natasha then explains is Alyssa Rand, who many people believe to, the, to be the world's savior and obeyed her unconditionally. The cast then finds more hubs that need to be deactivated. While deactivating the second hub, the main character faints again for another whisper of Plamia's echo. She says, My sins, my despair, must explore, must dig deeper. 
While deactivating the third hub, the main character then faints again for another whisper, which says the, the result of the calculation is irrefutable. The world cannot sustain the weight of humanity. Someone must make a sacrifice, and someone must bear the sins of the choice. To preserve civilization as we know it, the innocent will lament deeply until the nameless god drops the seed again. While deactivating the final hub, the main character faints for the final time for the final whisper of Plamia's echo. She says the host of the seed. Footsteps draw closer, nearly a thousand years of struggle. This world finally sees a light at the end of the tunnel. Find it and their messenger. Retrieve the seed from him. Then, wish for this world to be saved. With the solar core fully open now, we start to head towards it when we have an encounter with Capard. We then defeat Capard to continue forward on our path. Natasha stays behind to treat Capard as the rest of the crew encounter Kakolia. After beating Kakolia, we have reached the end of the story in the beta version and are told to stay tuned. Okay. Alright, yes. Wow. That is, uh, that's the end of the video. Um, I really appreciate the guys who stuck through and watched the whole thing. Um, I spent a long, long time on this video doing all the research, putting it all together, getting all the pictures, all the editing, all the voiceovers. And yeah, I just, I really appreciate those that have watched this video and stuck with it. And again, great, great thank you to Unreal Dreamer for allowing me to use clips from his VODs of the closed be uh, beta test during the explanation. That way you guys can see it happening as I explain it. It definitely jumped the quality of the video up. Uh, but yeah, if you guys enjoyed this, make sure to subscribe because I will continuously be making content for Honkai Star Rail. Hopefully I get into the closed beta test too, and I'll be streaming that the entire time. I'll also make videos on the lore that we get in there. Um, and then, yeah, when the game fully launches, I'll be making guides, character, t you know, team builds and whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Thank you guys for watching. See you in the next one.